All right, Revelation chapter 2. I hate to disturb you all, but... Yeah. But some of you look disturbed already. Revelation chapter 2. What was manna? What was it? Huh? Little wafers, huh? Like vanilla cookies? Vanilla wafers? No? Okay. How do you eat them? How do you cook them? You make manicotti. Or banana bread. Right? All right, we're going to look at that. Revelation chapter 2. Manicotti. Yeah. Revelation chapter 2. Uh, he, Jesus mentions this, uh, from what I could see, just one time. He mentions hidden manna. Um, in verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. And I've touched on that before. It's about continuing faith. It's about overcoming all the temptations, all the... Um, the trials that we go through, all the ways, all the tricks the devil tries to use to get us away from our Bible. If he can get us away and get us out of our Bible, that's our, we're learning during this um, Sunday sermons, we're learning that that's our defense. When you have the shield of faith, faith is the word of God. You can only get faith by hearing the word of God. And so we put our faith and our trust in what the Bible says, but not in what man says. Man will tell you things that are wrong. Man will lie to you. Uh, the second uh, part of the Watchman series is coming out today. And um, you may have heard I had more trouble recording it. I came in Wednesday, sat down, went through the whole thing. And when I looked at my... SD card that's in the camera, I found out it didn't record. So I spent like an hour and 15 minutes talking to myself and it's gone. And so I had to come in the next day and do it all over again. And I hate doing that. Um, so I had, had trouble doing it, but I finally got it, finally got it done. And just the, the lies that are told to people about what the Eucharist is, it, it just really, all you have to do is look at what the Pope says and then look at what the Bible says and you see that they're two entirely different things. They don't agree with each other. And you have to decide which one you're going to believe. Because if, I'm, if I've got two kids and they're both telling me two different stories about what happened, about how the cat ended up in the microwave, you know, he didn't get in there by himself. So what happened? You know, and you hear two completely different contradictory stories. Well, somebody's got to be lying and somebody's got to be telling the truth. And so who do you trust? So that's coming out today. But he said to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna? So think. Think about what he said and the word hidden and what Jesus promised us that if anything is hidden, I will reveal it. If you ask, it shall be given. If you seek, it shall be fine. If you knock, it shall be open unto you. And Jesus said, anything that is hidden shall be made manifest. Anything that is kept secret shall be known abroad. When he was with the disciples, he told them what I have spoken into your ear you pronounce from the housetops. And I've made a point of this before, but we do not have secret conclaves here at the church where we talk about our secret doctrines that we can't tell everybody else. We don't have that. Everything that we believe and everything that we are and everything that we think or know, 
we, we know it from the Bible and we don't hide the Bible from anybody. We share it. If anybody wants to know, Pastor, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? I'll tell you what I believe. And there are no secret teachings that we just can't let everybody out on the street know about. But that's how it is in some places. They have secret doctrines and secret ideas that they can't, they can't share with everybody. So if it's hidden manna now, it won't be hidden forever. God is going to reveal it. If you look in, um, turn over in Revelation 10. And the way we're going in Revelation, we'll be at Revelation 10 probably within the next 100 years at least. So um, in Revelation 10, John said he, that seven thunders uttered their voices. And then in verse 4, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And I'm going, ah, why didn't he let him write them down? So what are the seven thunders? I don't know. But I do believe they are written in the Bible. I don't believe John wrote them. For some reason, John was not allowed to write them. But anything secret or hidden like that at some point will be revealed. Even the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2, he's hidden now, but he will be revealed. Jesus for a while was hidden from the Jews. Many of them didn't understand who he was, but he began to reveal himself to them. And in some cases, when he did miracles, he would ask the people he did the miracles for, you know, see that you not tell this abroad. Well, what would be the first thing they do? They go tell everybody. Okay. So anything hidden, anything covered up is going to be made known. So keep that in mind. So let's look at what manna is according to the Bible. So the first place manna goes, manna shows up in incidentally, since it relates to the word of God, we go to Exodus 16, which just happens to be the 66th chapter of your Bible. It's 50 chapters in Genesis, 16 in the book of Exodus, that gives us 66. That's how many books there are in the Bible. And now for the first time, God is going to give us bread that comes down from heaven. And he's going to feed everybody. If you sort of look at everything that God has said up until this point, he sort of said it, well, when there was just Adam, what he spoke about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he spoke to Adam alone. Then we find later he speaks to Abraham. We find him speaking to Isaac and then Jacob. Um, eventually he's going to speak um, from Exodus 16 and Exodus 20, God's going to speak to the entire nation of Israel, only they're not going to like it. But here for the first time, we have God speaking or God sharing what he has on a mass scale. And so in Exodus chapter 16, verse four, here's what God said. Then said the Lord unto Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And if you count, that's exactly 66 words that God said to the people of Israel. Now, I want you to look at what he said. I'll rain bread from heaven for you. So we know the source of this manna, that it came directly down from heaven. Literally, it fell down out of the sky. And when he says from heaven, I believe that it not only did it, did it come out of the sky, but it came through the second heaven, which is what we call outer space, all the way from the third heaven, which is where God and his throne is. And we're going to find out exactly that this manna, this bread, 
The angels know about it. Okay, we're going to find that out in a little bit. But he says, the, the children of Israel shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them. Now remember, according to 1 Peter, our faith will be on trial. God's going to try our faith. Do you believe what God said? You can say you believe it today, but then bad times hit, troubling times hit. You may be upset at the world. You may be upset with God. That's happened. I've been upset with God before. I know some people right now that are struggling with that. They're struggling with being upset with God. And that happens. Fortunately for us, God loves us enough that when we get upset with him, he doesn't necessarily get upset with us. He understands. He loves us. Matthew, have you ever been angry at your mom and dad? I've been angry at my mom, but she loved me anyway. And if you look here, Israel's complaining again. They're always complaining, complaining, whining, everything else. And here God, all he's going to do is be good to them. Okay. But does God test us? Does God prove us? Yes. Yes. So here's this thing now laying on the ground they had never seen before. Okay, well, I don't know who the first person ever that goes out and eats something and says, I wonder if this will kill me or not. Okay. But they had to trust God. God, there was no, they're in a wilderness now. There is no food. There's nothing out there. And they have to trust God for this. So every day they wake up and the ground is covered with what looks like hoarfrost. It looks like frost covering the ground. And they were to go out, they were to gather in so much a rate every day. If they gathered too much, what happened to it the next day? It's stank and it bred worms if they gathered in too little what happened you went hungry because it only came out once a day if on the set if you if you went out on friday you were to gather in twice as much on friday than you would the previous day because the sabbath was the next day and they were not allowed to do any gathering on the Sabbath day. They were to rest. And so if you went out on Friday and gathered in as much for yourself for one day or your family for one day. And then you went out Saturday and there was no manna. You went hungry for a day. God did exactly what he said he's going to do. And I want you to think about this now because manna represents to us. It represents our Bible. Now, I've been making a point in this Watchman broadcast that the bread that Jesus told us to eat and the wine that he told us to drink, they represent his body, his blood, and his word. Because how many people in this world drink wine? Lots of people. Are they all going to heaven because they drink wine? How many people in this world eat bread? Unleavened bread. Lots of people. Does that mean they're going to heaven because they ate a piece of bread? No, it doesn't work that way. Just because your body ate something, that does not save you. What good does it do to partake communion, but not believe that Christ died for your sins? Does that do any good? 
No, because you don't believe it. So how many people go into church every Sunday and eat the Eucharist or eat the communion wafers thinking that that's going to save them when in fact it doesn't. It's faith that saves you. You believe and you trust that Christ died for your sins. He died to erase your debt completely with God. That no amount of goodness on our part will merit God's blessings in heaven. And God gives it to us as a free gift. You trust in that, but not necessarily the eating. So this manna represents our Bible. And since we don't literally tear pages out of our Bible, wad them up and chew them up and swallow them and say, boy, that's going to save me now. It is our soul that feeds from the word of God. Does that make sense? Your soul is feeding from the manna given to us by God from heaven to earth. We're reading this book and it is our soul that's benefiting from it. It is what makes us alive on the inside. And that's why he said that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And what God was going to do was, depending on how they treated this manna, was how they were going to treat God, the rest of God's word. If they believed God, then they would go out, gather as much as they were going to eat that day, and not really much more, and they would eat it. And then the next day, they'd have to go out and gather again. If they tried to gather a week's worth or even an extra day's worth, by the end of the day, it was going to start smelling and it was going to breed worms. God was going to get rid of it and says, you're going to have to go out the next day. And some obviously did not believe that until they went out the next day. And sure enough, the old manna was gone. They had to gather up new or they went out on the Sabbath day and found that there was no manna anywhere. So God was going to lead them in such a path as was going to force them to believe what God said. The letter of the law, what God, exactly what God said. Um, Psalm 78, this manna came directly from heaven. Psalm 78, verse 23, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat. And had given them, here it is, underline this, the corn of heaven. So, I think the manna was like in the form of a kernel of wheat or barley or corn. It was some kind of seed. Um, I don't remember, I think it's Exodus 16, where it said... That it had the appearance of a coriander seed. Yeah. If you look back in Exodus 16, verse 14, and when the dew that lay was gone up, and behold, upon the face of the wilderness, this, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. And the word manna means what is it? It's a question. Because it says, for they wist not what it was. They had no idea what this was. And let me give you the picture of that. Later on, we're going to find out that Jesus was the bread sent down from heaven. And when Jesus came the first time, children of Israel looked upon him, but they did not know who he was. They didn't have a clue. It's like Joseph's brothers. When they come to Egypt to buy food, they're standing in front of Joseph, their brother. But Joseph is looking strange to them and he's speaking Egyptian and they, ha they don't have a clue. They, they do not know that Joseph, their savior and their brother is standing right in front of them and they had no idea that it was Joseph. Until later on, he reveals... It is I, Joseph, your brother, be not afraid. What you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good. God sent me before you to save you alive. So they had no idea. Jesus comes the first time. Some of them are looking for the Messiah. They're looking right at Jesus and don't see him as the Messiah. They do not recognize him that way. Their eyes were blinded. 
And they could not tell. It took the Gentiles. It took God revealing it to us for the world to see that that was, in fact, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. Um, back in, I lost my place here. Uh, let's see here. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. Moses was wroth with them, and they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. It came to pass on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Uh, let's see here. I'm looking for the description of it. Look at verse 31. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed. Somebody look up a coriander seed. I don't know what a coriander seed looks like. White. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. That's where you got the wafer idea. It tasted like vanilla wafers. Honey wafer, honey grams. Honey graham crackers. Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth of the land of Egypt. So it came down from heaven. God had given them, according to Psalm 78, God had given them the corn of heaven. So they had this, an omer full, let's say it's a bag full of seed, like coriander seed or corn kernels or whatever. So what can you do with that? Let me see that. Yeah, kind of looks like chickpeas. That's what it looks like. Garbanzo beans, sort of. So what can you do with that? What did they do with it? Yeah, you put it in a mortar. And you take and you beat it. And you mill it like you would corn or wheat. You'd mill it and turn it into flour. Then they would take that, and maybe add a little oil, add a little water, maybe a little salt that they had it. And they would take that and they would put it on their hearth and they would make bread out of it. Flat bread or whatever they wanted to. You could make, I don't know, if you killed a goat, you could make a shepherd's pie out of it. You know, just anything. But it was bread. It was literally bread in the form of seed that came down from heaven and it was their responsibility to make sure that they had enough for a day. It was their responsibility to, once they had it, I don't know if you could maybe roast it and eat the kernels. I don't know if it was like popcorn. You could eat it like that. I don't know. But whatever you could do with any type, any type of grain, they learned to do with manna. And I guess you could make manicotti. You could take, you could take the seeds and grind them into flour and make you a dough and make you noodles or whatever. You can have spaghetti, manna spaghetti, manna and cheese, right? You can, you can make it all. But it was like the corn of heaven. And notice this in verse 25. Man did eat angels food and he sent them meat to the full. And the thing is, they had plenty. Every family could go out and gather. There was plenty to gather every single day so that nobody had to go hungry. Nobody did. Back to that phrase, man did eat angels food. Is the Bible being literal on that, do you think? I do. Oh, I do. Do angels eat? I can show you two of them. They got fat. They got, they got fed well. The two angels that accompanied Jesus to go see Abram, Abraham by this time, and Abraham knew who they were. Sit down. Called for his servants to come over there and wash their feet. And he killed a kid. And they dressed it, probably roasted it, and took some fine flour and made cakes with it. And they had goat or lamb or cattle. 
and they had steaks and they had bread. And they had it. I mean, they had it good. And then the two angels go to Sodom. What's the first thing Lot does? Come into my house. And, and he fed them. And those angels are getting well fed everywhere they go. We don't think of it that way, but they do. God gives, apparently, he gives the angels in heaven of his own bread to eat. And they get to eat it every day. Now, eventually, though, what happens to Israel after eating manna for about a year? It is the nature, it is our depraved human nature that is never satisfied with what we have. We're the people who in this country stand and fan the refrigerator door. A refrigerator full of food and say, I'm hungry, I just don't know what I want. And we'll look at that, we'll go to the pantry, we'll go to the bread box, we'll go to the freezer, we'll go to the refrigerator again. We've got a house full of food, but we always want something that we don't have. Sound familiar? Sounds familiar. Our nature, our depraved human nature, is what draws us out of the Word of God And causes us to want to look in other places for satisfaction. So you have churches now that no longer feed manna from heaven to their people. They look for better things to give, better things to eat on. So the pastors spend all week reading books or they spend all week on the internet looking up different things, looking for new ideas, new philosophies, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things because we can't keep doing the same old thing over and over and over again because people, people will get out. They'll leave our church if we just keep doing the same old thing over and over and over again. What I found the best thing to do is to just keep going back to the manna that God gave us. Because if you want it to be, God can make it brand new for you every single day. I'm telling you, there are treasures in this book. You have no idea that they're there. You have no idea. And the miracle about reading the Bible daily is that you will find things in there that you never knew existed before. I got a big smile on my face because somebody's here and you don't know it yet. Things that you never knew were in the Bible, things that you never read before, things or things that you've read it a hundred times and never saw it that way before. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost... Puts fresh oil on that manna. And gives it a flavor like you've never had before. And you think, this is amazing. This is great. Well, this is the same manna I've had all my life. But boy, is it brand new now. Because that's the nature of heaven. Our, our depraved nature. This is why, this is what, I don't know who figured it out. Henry Ford made Model T's. For years, same exact car for years. And people were buying them, but he noticed the sales were slipping. People weren't buying Model T's anymore. And he didn't know, he thought, well, surely everybody doesn't have a car already. And then somebody came up with the idea, why don't we change the fenders? Why don't we put a radio in there? Why don't we change the back seat a little bit? Give it more leg room. So somebody came up with the model year car that the 1939 car was different than the 1938 car. And you've got people out there, no kidding, who buy a new car every two years. 
so they can have the new thing that comes out because I've already had the old thing. It's, it's old. It's a year and a half old. Well, my goodness, I've got almost 18,000 miles on that thing and the ashtrays are full. I got to trade it in. And that's how people are. And that's what's going on in a lot of people's lives who go to church. They're always looking, they're like the Athenians. They're always wanting some new thing, some new thing, some new thing to keep them rolling in. And this is why the churches have had to change everything. And then in two years, three years from now, they have to change it all again and then change it all again. This is why the Bible translations have to keep changing. They can't keep selling you the same NIV that they came up with in 1980. They can't keep selling that Bible. So let's revise it again, sell you a new copy of it. And but we've significantly went through and changed a bunch of it. And now you've got a different Bible than the one you had five, ten years ago. But with God's food, it's not so. John chapter six, verse 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Make no mistake. This was miracle food that literally came down to them from heaven. And so when you match that up with the Bible, where did our Bible come from? Was it written by men? Did men just sit and figure all this out? No. The Bible, God says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Ezekiel was handed a roll of a book. Ezekiel ate the book. And God said, now go speak my words to your people. In fact, we're going to see that in a minute. In Exodus, this is what I like. It was sweet. In Exodus 16, 31, the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And who doesn't like a little toast or a biscuit with butter on it, hot butter, and then pour you some honey on that. Have I made you hungry yet? Don't leave church. Proverbs 25, 16, hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. Now I will tell you, you, you can read too much Bible in a day. There's only so much that your mind and your spirit will retain in a day. And I've heard people brag, I read the Bible 16 hours a day every day. I don't believe them. What happens if you eat too much honey or fudge? I can eat one piece of fudge a year. It's sweet. Exodus 3, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, or Ezekiel 3, son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll. And it was a roll of a book. Go and speak into the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I gave thee. And then did I eat it. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. What was God giving Ezekiel? His word. It was in a book rolled up like a croissant. And he ate it and it tasted like honey. And to those of us who love the word of God, it's sweet every time we read it. It's preserved. Look at this. In Exodus 16, 33, Moses said unto Aaron, take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. They gathered a pot full of the manna and they put that pot inside the Ark of the Covenant. And for hundreds of years, I don't know, it may still be in there, but for hundreds of years, that manna was preserved inside the Ark of the Covenant so that the people of Israel every now and then, I don't know if they took it out every so often and gave everybody a glimpse of it. This is the manna that God gave our forefathers back in the wilderness. It was still perfect and it was still intact. Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Psalm 102, 18. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people sh which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book. That it may be for the time to come forever and ever. If God is able to miraculously preserve some coriander seeds inside of a box... Surely he can preserve 
every word of God for us nowadays. Somebody say amen. Is this Bible any less the word of God than it was in Moses' day? No, it's just as much as the word of God has ever been. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, dear God, for the blessings. This beautiful day you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for those who have gathered here today. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless your word, that it be sweet to our taste. Father, that its preserved words would always be a source of nutrition for our souls. God, that we would desire, we would desire your word more than we desire honey, more than we desire the sweetness of this world. God, we desire the sweetness and the fresh oil from heaven. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you'd bless your people with your word so that, Father, they are renewed every day by their knowledge of your word. God, that you give us an interest and a heart and help us, dear God, to discard our flesh when we read the Bible, but see it as something brand new for our souls every day. God, just bless your word the way you bless manna and feed your people today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.